The Blue Voice of the Water is actually a free translation of a Portuguese verse that literally would be translated to the blue accent of the water. It comes from a poem uh, written by a Brazilian writer called Manuel de Barros. And in this poem, he, he speaks about blue um, as a color that is somehow tracing. He says sentences like, uh, I follow the birds to find the blue, or um, the voice of the water has a blue accent. And uh, in this poem, which I found very beautiful, um, I also found some trigger to start writing the first piece of the CD. Uh, this was a commission from uh, a Brazilian and the Portuguese orchestra. Uh, so I wanted to somehow connect the two countries and the fact that it was going to be played twice in the two sides of the ocean. Um, so I thought, well, of course, this is really the perfect connection, the water that connects the two countries, uh, but not in a traditional historical background like talking about the history and the navigators going from Portugal to Brazil and so on. I was not very much interested to follow that path. So I, I thought this was much, much more poetic, much more free, and at the same time it le left me a lot of room and space to use the poem not literally, not to do a tone painting like trying to describe the poem. No, this uh, idea of um, dealing with uh, different accents, uh, almost like in our mutual use of the Portuguese language. We, we use the same language, but we have different accents. And when we look at the water, depending on the light, depending on the sky, uh, it also gets different colors, different accents, as Manuel de Barros says in his, in his poem. So that was also very helpful to work um, color, orchestration, texture, and timbre uh, in the writing of this piece. So uh, the blue voice of the water became uh, the main title of this CD. This CD is made with uh, four live recordings of four orchestral works that I've wrote and premiered within the last five years or so. Um, so uh, I thought as these works were being performed live, it was a very good opportunity to, to record because uh, writing for orchestra can be very exciting, but at the same time, it's so difficult sometimes to have the works um, getting performances. Um, and many times a living composer has this situation of having a work played and then has to wait two, three, four, five years until the, the music is played again. So it's very crucial that we record um, the music. So that was my first target actually, was to keep a memory of the performed music. But then of course um, I decided to make very good quality recordings of these live performances. Um, and uh, in the end I gathered these four works, well, the first one, The Blue Voice of the Water, uh, was premiered with a Gulbenkian Orchestra, conducted by Susanna Malki, so we did a live recording of that performance. Um, then the second work on the CD is a Cello Concerto, which is, which is actually my most recent work that was premiered this year. Um, and. Um, it was dedicated to the cellist that premiered the, 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 the piece, uh, Philippe Quaresma. This is um, a commission from the National Opera Theatre uh, and the Portuguese Symphony Orchestra because I'm their composer in residence. Uh, so this was part of the composing in residence scheme. Um, then the third piece in the CD is um, a commission from the Seattle Symphony in the United States and uh, Ludovic Morlot, the conductor, 
Um, they have a very interesting um, scheme of commissioning composers to write music inspired by uh, musicians uh, from Seattle or related with Seattle because Seattle is a city with big names from Jimi Hendrix to Nirvana, Kurt Cobain and so they have this um, um, collection of music that is very popular and I thought that by commissioning composers to write music inspired by these names they could also um, create this scheme that they call the sonic evolution. So it's clearly um, a, a series of commissions to connect with younger audiences. Um, I, when I was given uh, the list of musicians from Seattle that I could choose to write my own piece, I saw that one of the musicians they had there was Bill Frizzell, which is an amazing jazz guitar player and composer that I m very much admire for a long time. So I said, well, I want this one for me. I want to keep Bill Frizzell for my, for my composition. And so the piece is called Friesland uh, because it's uh, kind of a no man's land work uh, in the sense that it's inspired by some of his songs, uh, some of his works in different cities. Uh, so it's a bit like Bill Frizzell's land um, but at the same time, it's a no man's land. It's, it's my music uh, working his material. Um, and that was what triggered this uh, third piece in the, in the CD. The last piece in the CD is called um, Before Spring, a Tribute to the Right. And this is probably the craziest commission that I ever accepted uh, because it was... Uh, originally written for a chamber orchestra and then I later scored it for a symphony orchestra and the idea was to have the piece played before a performance of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. So this is the kind of thing that no composer should accept, you know, writing something to be performed as a preparation for a performance of Stravinsky's uh, The Rite of Spring, which is of course, a masterpiece and a work that have always been uh, in my heart since I remember loving music. And um, actually, the performance of Stravinsky's work was also connected with the world premiere of a new choreography. So my contribution was a very modest kind of introduction to uh, the main thing in that, in that performance, in that, con in that day. Um, so the title comes right, what it, it says right what, what it is. It's a piece to be played before the right. Uh, and um, then I thought that the piece had worked uh, well. I hope it did. It did. And um, uh, I scored it for symphony orchestra, and this has actually had quite a few performances. And um, the Porto Casa de Musica. Um, scheduled this work very recently and I also recorded it live for the, for the CD. One of the uh, original ideas for the title was uh, to call it like uh, Frizzle Prints, making like this game word with fingerprints. Uh, but when I started searching um, in the internet, uh, words and subjects related with Frizzell, um, I came across with Friesland, not the Dutch Friesland, but actually an old medieval uh, land that is uh, mapped by um, Italian uh, navigators. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a mystery island, uh, well, not an island, it's a, uh, I can't remember exactly what is the shape of, of the land, but it, 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 it's thought to be somewhere between Iceland and Groenland. Uh, so some people say it was a mistake from the cartographers. But for um, a long time, the sailors actually thought that this land was there. And I found it a very beautiful idea, the fact that this 
land, mysterious land that actually does not exist, or maybe it did, but it doesn't exist anymore, uh, was very um, convenient to connect with the idea of this music that was also somehow mysterious because it's inspired by Bill Frizzell, uh, but it's, as I said before, it's, it's a no man's land music. It's, it's really halfway between his input, his material that I took as a, uh, a seed to, to write the music and my own way of making uh, music. Uh, so it's, it's really very funny that um, in the end, the fact that this work also connects with the sea and navigation and this uh, old cartography uh, creates a bridge with the first work of the CD, which is the, the blue voice of the water. As I found this connection with uh, ancient times, um, the piece starts um, like uh, with a chacon um, introduced in the cellos, um, and um, on the top of that, the, the orchestra builds different layers of material. Um, and this original material is actually taken from a melody um, by Bill Frizzell. Bill Frizzell. So it's like um, starting from the uh, composer to, to, to whom I'm making a, a, a tribute or this homage, starting from his own material, his own melody, but changing its character to a more uh, medieval Renaissance sound world. But at the same time, the, the, the orchestration is very mysterious, very textural, uh, exploring a lot of uh, small details of color and, and timbre, and, and then gradually it develops um, to a more uh, dense, orchestration uh, with uh, overlapping layers of material and uh, continuously like uh, if we would be doing like a, a journey traveling through different stops where every time we get to these moments we identify like uh, four bars from Bill Frizzell uh, so it's like this journey that goes through um, different quotations, but as soon as it gets there, it departs and it changes and goes to another one. So it's traveling from one to the other. What I, what I did when I was going to start to write that piece, I, I, I listened to a lot of his works. He was very kind because he sent me his own scores of dozens of music. He sent me uh, almost of his CDs. Uh, uh, and I was listening to a, to a lot of these uh, works and uh, all of a sudden I would say, wow, oh, these four bars, I'm going, like making a sample. And this, this one is in my memory. Now I li listen to a new one. Oh, I like this one. Now this one is also in my hard disk. So I, I started collecting like uh, five, six different soundscapes. soundscapes. Uh, taken from his music and then I built this one movement journey just like traveling from one island to another island so it's like a Bill Frizzell archipelago uh, and my music traveling around it from one island to the other. I tend to write music starting from the first bar to the last one, actually. It's very rare. If I have to think of works that I've written where I change the order of sections or movements, or it mostly happened with stage music or dance. Um, but um, when, on what concerns writing uh, concert music, purely concert music, not to be staged or whatsoever. Um, 
I would say that most of my works just were composed from, through composed from the first bar to the last one. Um, I also am not a big fan of quotation, um, unless again it's under a context of uh, some dramatic work. It can happen for various reasons related with text or so ever, but for uh, concert music, I very rarely use quotation. So it's funny that in this CD I have two works that actually quote the music of other composers. But this was the consequence of the specifics of the commissions that I had in hand. Uh, and um, I tried very hard, I don't know if I succeeded, but I tried very hard not to follow the pastiche approach, which I can understand, but it's not my uh, idiom, my way of expressing myself. Um, so, for example, uh, when I mentioned that with Friesland I'm moving from one soundscape to the other one, it's because I really don't want... Because I even, even if I wanted, I just couldn't do it. I, I couldn't make music like Bill Frizzell does. Uh, that would be really a total failure. So I have to do my own music and just explore uh, what I can take out of uh, these small quotations that appear like um, sometimes if you see in a, in a, in a painting, uh, sometimes there are some things that are hidden behind the first texture. And then when you get closer to the canvas, you can see that there's something really hi hiding behind. Uh, and that's more the concept I like. It's not obvious. It's hiding behind and then sometimes we can unveil it or cover it again. And that's the way I worked with quotation. The same thing with Before Spring and um, using Stravinsky's material. It's very dangerous. And it's one of the most quoted pieces written in the 20th century. So uh, as... Even the subject for the uh, Rite of Spring is a ritual of fertility, the celebration of um, the spring. Uh, um, everything that is connected with this idea um, can be also explored, musically speaking, like the small seeds that I take from Stravinsky's score. Um, I put them under the soil or under the score and then I hope that the fertile land, the fertile land that is the score uh, gives birth to some new material. So the seed is there but it's actually hidden. It's not uh, trying to make perceptible uh, this line from the bassoon or this line from the trumpet or whatever. Um, so for example the, the that piece just ends with the C sustained, played in the bassoon, uh, which is actually the first note that is going to be heard in the beginning of the Rite of Spring. So in the end, I don't need to use any more material but the first note sustained, played in the bassoon. So everyone, when they listen to that piece and they listen to this bassoon playing the C, they say, ah, oh, that's the Rite of Spring. So. It's the kind of quotation I like, in the sense that it's there, you understand it, but it's not too obvious. Um, and at the same time, it helps me avoiding the danger of the pastiche. When I started studying composition, for me it was clear that I wanted to write for the orchestra. Um, I play the piano to compose, but I don't consider myself a performer. Um, and therefore, I never had um, a clear preference for this or that instrument. Um, nor did I have a preference for exploring, for example, electronics as a way of expression. Um, or other media. I think that the, the media that I always wanted for sure 
to try was the orchestra. So I feared the orchestra a lot because it's a huge responsibility. It's like a vertigo when you approach a symphony orchestra and you have those huge amount of people waiting to play your music. It's really scary. But at, at the same time, it was really a, a temptation that I always had. So I knew that I had to write for the orchestra. The, the orchestra was my favorite instrument. Um, and um, accidentally, accidentally uh, it turned out to be probably the, the instrument to which I've been more uh, focused in the past 10, 15 years. I've been writing regularly for, for orchestra. Uh, I have more works written for orchestra than, for example, for chamber music, which is a bit unusual. Um, and um, I really love it because it's um, it's a, a media that allows you to write focus not only in uh, duration and pitch like a b-dimensional um, concept like uh, the music starts here is going to finish there the higher notes are here the lower notes are there and then you have to fill it in like a, a bi-dimensional space of uh, highs and durations the orchestra is actually something that is very special uh, so you can write everything uh, trying to give a more I would say three-dimensional perception of sound. Um, like, um, for example, like with characters on stage, if uh, uh, an actor goes to the front of stage and then goes back and another one comes from the right and leaves from to the left and all this density and all this movement that is really three-dimensional. Nothing is just entering from left, leaving from right, and just saying the text. And um, I think that the, the, the writing for orchestra, well, actually the writing for any instrument, even with a solo instrument, you can explore that. But with the orchestra, of course, you have a lot of tools available. Um, and uh, so even before starting to think we, what, what is the way I'm going to use to control the harmony, what kind of notes am I going to use? Is it going to be more chromatic or more diatonic or whatever? Um, my first concerns are always gesture um, and um, musical ideas um, that um, don't have necessarily to be purely musical. Uh, they can be inspired by many things um, from abstract to visual to um, texts, material, and then I have that fantastic tool which is a group of musicians uh, that can put the sound in the foreground, in the middle ground, in the background, in, in the right, in the left, top, bottom, and so this is really a big excitement. So when I write for orchestra, I feel very entertained and very excited. It's, it's very slow actually, the process, because I'm so focused in these details that um, normally a good working day ends up to give me like 10 seconds of music. Uh, so it's, it's a slow process, but um, it has to be that way. Um, for the kind of sound world that I'm trying to search and to portray, it, I don't think it would be possible to do it in a fast speed. So I, I try to give as much time as I can to make it slowly and uh, detailed. I, I have a, a very strong um, background related with visual arts. Um, when I finished my secondary studies, I actually started studying film uh, and only after that I, I went to study uh, composition 
Um, at the same time, um, my family background is very much involved with visual arts. So I have a very close relation with uh, artists uh, in the field of architecture and painting, even um, set designing for theatre and opera and dance and so on. So since a very early age, I was always in contact with visual stimuli. Um, and uh, so, of course, when, when I start thinking of sound as matter, something that you can shape, actually, um, it's something that, of course, it's very obvious when you think of electronic music, for example, uh, and all of the conquests made by all the electroacoustic composers in the last century, but it's uh, something that you can actually apply for any kind of instrumental tools that you use to control sound and volume and shape and density. Uh, so imagining a sound that uh, comes from the background and then it goes to the foreground and then it goes back again and then it collides with another object. Uh, of course, this is, this is not new. If you listen to the music by Edgar Varese and so many other composers, <laughs> you find a lot of these things uh, uh, and this is something that um, I'm not concerned if it is new or if it is not new. I'm concerned that it's really exciting. <laughs> and um, so then the other thing, like um, thinking of musical narrative not controlled by pre-composed structures, structures or by pre-existent formulas, that you can apply in, in the hope that this will give uh, proportion and um, uh, a sense of uh, controlled narrative to the music. Um, I tend to think much more in a visual way uh, and to make the process um, in a more organic way um, giving room to the musical ideas and to the music material to develop in a natural way and to expand. And um, so, again, the visual idea of like getting a train and watching outside the window and see all the landscape changing and all of a sudden you started from one point and you arrived to another one. But between the two points, there was a journey, there was a, a, a narrative. Um, and you can find that, of course, in film. You can find that um, in the visual arts. I like a lot to build my compositions. Many times they are one single movement works, like three of the pieces in this CD. But the structure is very often made with like different panels, like a polyptic painting uh, that you can uh, see that when you gather these different panels, they all form these, um, they all frame this uh, image uh, in a very coherent manner. So also science, um, physics, chemics, uh, all these um, phenomena from light to sound to everything that surrounds us can be extremely stimulating and uh, trigger musical ideas. Um, so out of this, I would say that um, probably the last thing I, I'm concerned with when I start writing a piece is formulas, structures, uh, or try to achieve in advance something that uh, in the end, I know that I cannot control totally because when you start writing the music, the music gets its own wings and sometimes you plan, I'm going towards that direction, but then the music material says, no, no, you have to go to that, the other direction. Um, so sometimes more than um, very technical structures, I, um, I even do like... Um, uh, drawings of shapes and uh, things that I I think that can visually describe the kind of density that I, that I want to give to the music. 
Sometimes I put those papers on my desk or on the floor and I try to follow those schemes, so to speak, uh, when putting my dots on paper. But uh, it always happens that from a certain point I, I realize that the first three, four pages, I'm quite faithful to it, but from the fifth page onwards, it's a complete different sketch. It's a complete different um, direction. So the music took control of the process, and I like it. I'm not concerned or worried at all um, if I realize that as, at a certain point I lose control, so to speak, of uh, the, what's going to happen in, in the music. On the other hand, I think it's uh, a bit dangerous when we when we think of uh, what is the ideal way to create music or any other form of art. Uh, every time I talk about the way I do things or the way I think I'm doing things, because things then continuously continuously change, you know. Uh, I'm not writing music now as I was writing 10 years ago or 15, 20 years ago. So things are always changing. And we, hopefully we keep surprising ourselves. Uh, but one thing I'm always care, uh, careful with is not to say that I believe that this is the answer. Uh, I can only find the answers to my own problems each time I have to write a new piece. Um, and I perfectly accept any other option if a composer tells me that he or she deeply believes that everything has to be pre-composed and extremely controlled for the sake of form and coherence, and I totally accept it. If it works musically, I couldn't care the less what is the process behind, you know, it's uh, in, in the end, each, each one of us finds uh, a way to, to, to make things happen. And each one finds uh, his own comfort, because it's what we're talking about. We need to feel comfortable and um, confident that we can really put our ideas uh, working. I would mention uh, that the cello concerto is quite different, not statically, but uh, in the process of its making uh, from the other works in the CD, because it has a soloist. So this is something um, that separates the, this piece from the remaining in the program. Um, also, because it's the only one that has different movements, uh, it's the longer piece in the CD. Uh, but probably the most interesting thing is that when you are writing a concerto and you are lucky to be a good friend of the soloist that is going to premiere, which was the case, uh, it's really a fantastic experience because no matter how much you think you can really control uh, the writing of music, um, then the performer arrives and says, well, you are crazy, I do not have six fingers <laughs> on each hand, or uh, probably this is going to work much better if you just change this note, or can we do the bowing differently? And, and then it's really very exciting when you start getting this input. And uh, every time I have the chance to work with soloists, either instrumentists or singers, uh, I always love to leave a door open for revising things when I start working with them. Because they, um, they really can inspire with some incredible solutions and sometimes things that are so simple you can really Sometimes they understand where you are wanting to direct your music, where are you wanting to go, 
uh, but you are just a bit lost in the process and they say, well, but if we do this, it's going to be much simpler and much more effective. And Philippe um, Quaresma is a very experienced uh, performer doing from ancient music to contemporary music. Um, and he was very generous. So every time I finished one movement, I sent him the music, he studied it, and then we met and they played the music for me and we did a lot of this interaction and changed things. Even during the, the dress rehearsal, we were still changing some small details. Um, so I, I think that um, when you are writing uh, for a soloist, uh, for a work like a concerto, uh, it really changes a lot of the, the normal procedures when you're writing just a purely instrumental piece. Uh, on the other hand, um, of course, I live in the 21st century and um, I don't feel the relation of the soloists with the orchestra in the same way that in other periods other composers would be probably interested. For example, uh, explore all the virtuosity or all the, the, the technique of the, of the soloist, putting the leading instrument always in the foreground, uh, leaving many times the orchestra almost as a secondary character. It, that's not how I conceive a, a concerto today. I think that um, the, in this concerto I tried to give sometimes the cello, the leading voice, of course, to be in the foreground, but other times the orchestra is leading the, the narrative. Some other times they are competing or they are just connected um, in the same level or same degree of relevance. Um, and um, many sections of this concerto actually sound extremely simple, um, almost easy to, to be performed, uh, but it's not easy at all, the concerto actually. Uh, Flip, um, uh, when he started working with me, sometimes he said, Probably if I would have more notes or if it, be, if it would be faster, it would be easier. Uh, some things that um, apparently are so simple are giving me so much trouble to get the correct intonation, the correct expression, the, ex the, the, the most uh, correct color or, or shape that uh, I, I assume that you want it to have in this music. So, um, it's really uh, a mystery uh, uh, how things can develop and sometimes they can be apparently very complex and in the end they are very simple or the other way around. And this game, uh, this um, conflict between uh, forces uh, is, is very exciting and very appealing uh, in the writing of a concerto. The Blue Voice of the Water, um, it's, um, of course, although it doesn't try to portray the poem in a literal way, as I said before, so it's not a tone painting of Manuel de Barros' poem, um, there is this constant idea of uh, dealing with color, the blue color, um, that comes from the ocean. Um, so the music sometimes is much more dramatic and much more heavy and dense. It's uh, sometimes like if um, we are diving deep to the deep of the ocean and then <clears throat> we get uh, darker colors of blue, um, almost imagining that uh, we are getting to a point where the light just cannot break through to get down. And 
little by little the music develops as if we are being transported to the surface again and everything becomes more luminous and you start getting different tones of blue um, and then it goes again deep so it's like a diving and coming to the surface and diving and coming to the surface um, but um, I to be honest I cannot say that there is an ending uh, in the traditional sense that uh, okay this is a journey uh, through the sea, from one land to the other. No, it's nothing like that. It's much more abstract. So um, it's about flowing, about density, about um, um, a more uh, dark uh, and dense um, texture that develops to other situations uh, that are contrasting. And the, this game of changes uh, is what gives the, the flow to the music. Um, <clears throat> up to a point where the process stops. So in a way I almost could say that uh, it's a kind of form that uh, the music could probably stop a bit earlier or a bit later. <laughs> uh, but it just ends up like it is. For this journey, for this um, input that I got from these words, from this poem, I thought that uh, they could stimulate me, uh, but they could not drive me from the beginning to the end, you see. So uh, uh, from a certain point, again, I, I, I free myself from the words, I free myself from, from the poem, and uh, the music gains its own will. Um, but again, we are talking about uh, things that I've mentioned before. Uh, and the blue, of course, it's the color that becomes the main subject because there is this idea connected with water and uh, light. And, and this is something that is also, probably I could put it this way, it's also very personal because I live near the sea. I've, I've always lived... Um, um, 10 minutes away from the sea and, uh, uh, and the river. So the, the, the relation with water, the relation with the, the, the colors and the light of this city, and, um, my personal relation with uh, the line of the horizon, it's, it's, it's something that I cannot detach from my own personality. And uh, I suppose that these things then they have a consequence in the way you, you express yourself, even in an abstract manner as composing music. I think that the, the orchestras, uh, the relation when we write for orchestra only without soloists, uh, is on the other hand completely different from when you work today with a soloist or when you wrote when you when you write for um, chamber music, for example. Um, unfortunately, today we live uh, under a context that gives very little time for composers to uh, experiment with the orchestras. It's very often to see and I talk with my colleagues and sometimes I hear oh, the first time the piece was played from the beginning to the end was during the premiere. This is not very rare. Um, the, the time for rehearsing is shorter and shorter every time. The orchestras became like uh, big organizations, very complex, very bureaucratic. Everything that goes calls for a certain degree of exception can create a serious headache uh, between um, the organization, the musicians, the composer. It's, it's, it's really 
so it's funny because it's very contradictory. I was saying some minutes ago that I love the orchestra and write for the orchestra, but then when I think how complex it is to deal with an orchestra, probably the, the, wise, the, the wisest thing to do is, okay, quit the orchestra, write electronic music, write chamber music. Uh, and sometimes it really uh, demands a certain degree of, well, being stubborn and just don't quit and try and try and try. Uh, so if I compare this situation with the old times, uh, even if we go back to Haydn, you know, it's like composing and experimenting and changing and composing. There is a close relation between the composer and the orchestra. And now that's really very difficult. So most of the times, and this is not the exception when on what concerns the, the four works premiered in this, recorded in this CD, what normally happens is that we get there, we have two, three rehearsals, and then it's the premiere. And uh, many times you have the feeling that now the, that the performance was made, now it's time to start making it sound better and shaping things and correcting things and uh, having a second and a third chance to really pass as much as you want um, and to, to, to make the, the piece as much, as much effective as it can be. But let's be realistic, this is not what happens today. So what is my solution for this problem? Well, in a way I, have, I try to have two solutions. One is like a wishful thinking that after this piece, I can write another one and I can correct in the next piece what went wrong in the previous one. It's very much a learning process. It's like learning orchestration by composing one after the other. And, uh, and then you become probably a bit more pragmatic in the sense that you know in advance what might happen if you do this or if you do that. The other solution, um, it's not properly, properly a solution, but it's what I try to do, is to develop as much as I can my skill to uh, anticipate how things can work. Um, so it's, it's uh, why I say it's not a solution, it's, it's more a consequence. It's, it's, if you get that skill, then you become little by little more confident that you are going to have 30 minutes, 50 minutes to rehearse that piece and uh, it's going to be working uh, because you wrote the music in a way that you believe that it's going to, to, to give you the results you are expecting to have. On the other hand, I think this is probably a message that um, composers need to thrive and to, to, to keep fighting for. Uh, um, the system as it is uh, can be very frustrating uh, in uh, cutting the, the room for experimentation. We need to experiment, we need to take risks and uh, and if the the, the, the orchestras, the, the, the performances, the the managers don't keep a rooms a certain amount of room in their programming and in their way of doing things for this experimentation to happen, and I don't mean only with young composers, with any composer of any age, things are going to be very very hard uh, because many composers may end up uh, simplifying things because they don't want to take risks. That's something that I, I don't do. I prefer, I prefer to take the risk of something going wrong, but not quitting uh, to experiment something that I believe that can be successful. The worst thing that can happen is that when I get on rehearsal, sometimes I realize, oh, this is not working as I imagined. Okay, next time I have to try it differently. But really, it's, it's really a, 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 
a very stressful situation today. Orchestras are not giving uh, enough time as much as they should, I think. One of the very few advantages of getting older <laughs> is the, the fact that we, little by little, learn to take advantage of adversity. Uh, so I remember a few years ago, uh, if I would want this very strange percussion instrument, and if a manager from an orchestra would say, we cannot have that instrument because we have to hire it and it's very expensive, then I would feel very frustrated and I would say, oh, how unfair this is, I want that instrument. Or I want uh, more double basses or I want more horns. Or, and, and little by little you start being confronted with uh, situations that they tell you, this is what we've got and then you have to find solutions. So. You, you can all actually see as half full the glass of water or half empty. Uh, I actually went through a situation once with a conductor, a, a, a good friend of mine, David Allen Miller. Uh, he commissioned me a piece for the Albany Symphony Orchestra in New York. And David knew that I wanted always to use a lot of percussion instruments. Uh, and as a joke, he told me that for that piece, he only had a vibraphone and a timpani and a bass drum. But it was a, jo a joke. I didn't know that. And, and I took it seriously. And I thought, oh my god, how, how am I going to write the piece with one vibraphone only, timpani and one bass drum? And I did it. <laughs> and then when I got to, con to the concert, uh, he, he had a lot of percussion for other pieces in the program. And I said, come on, you told me it was just these three instruments and say, oh, it was just to control you a little, you know. <laughs> it was a joke. But, but in the end, it worked out. Uh, I took a lesson from that because by, by being uh, so constrained, I had to find solutions other ways. So I even try to pass this, that message sometimes to my students. Uh, a constraint can be a source of inspiration in a way. <laughs>